The Inception of Dunkin' Donuts When you stop to think about it, donuts really are the perfect food. They're sweet, have the most aesthetically pleasing shape, and you really can't find one bad thing about it. Just the words get me fantasizing of sugary goodness, and Dunkin' has climbed its way to the top to become the go-to for all things donuts and coffee. If you're new to the channel, welcome to Business Unmasked, where we unmask the stories behind interesting and successful companies. Hit the like button so more people can hear stories like these, and subscribe if you aren't already subscribed. Now let's get to the unmasking. This coffee brand that has stores almost everywhere in the world all started with a young boy called William, who was born back in 1916 in Massachusetts and brought up in the Dorchester neighborhood of Boston. Born to be someone who would one day change the way the world viewed coffee, a true entrepreneur. His entrepreneurial spirit was unbeatable. William was a child when his family's privately owned business was a victim of the Great Depression. He decided to quit and start working. Now, I'm sure you can imagine that an 8th grade dropout with no real qualifications or experience would probably have to work a lot of odd jobs. And that was true for William. He delivered groceries, shined shoes, he even sold ice. Like that one dude from Frozen. He transported a block of ice to the New Hampshire racetracks and sold them as ice chips, making $171 in one night. Supporting his family at a young age was not easy, but he was determined. He worked to deliver telegrams, and the faster he worked, the more commission he'd get. It wasn't long until he was the best in his division, proving that with ambition and hard work, you can, in fact, do anything. He didn't stay there for long, though, at the age of 17, he started selling ice cream out of trucks for three years until the draft board got in touch with him. World War II saw him in need of an essential job if he didn't want to be drafted into the army. So once again, he left home and found himself at a shipyard in Quincy. He refused to settle for a minimum wage job, securing the idea that he deserved more. They offered him a position as an electrician with the maximum amount of salary they could afford, but quickly realized that he did not really know how to be an electrician. Refusing to be deterred by something as measly as not knowing how to do the job, he continued working and learning. Ironically, the most important lesson he took from this experience had nothing to do with his actual job. What he noticed was that his fellow workers didn't have access to proper food, an essential necessity, and ever the opportunist, he jumped at the chance to provide just that. Using $1,000 from his savings and $1,500 from bonds, he started industrial luncheon services and served sandwiches, espresso, donuts, and snacks out of an old telephone company truck, which are nothing but our beloved food truck. He slowly realized that what people were missing was great coffee. Back then, the coffee that most people drank was either burnt or was essentially just really diluted bean water, which sounds quite unappetizing to the earthy bitter concoction we know today. So William decided that he was going to sell not just good coffee, but great coffee. And so he did just that. In 1948, he stepped up from running food trucks and opened the open kettle instead. Despite that popular opinion that selling coffee for a total of 10 cents, which was a lot of money back then apparently, was a little nut, he he did really well, netting over $5,000 every week. A part of the reason for their success was the variety of donuts that they offered, almost 52 flavors which back then was unheard of, but William wasn't satisfied. The name didn't quite feel right until he noticed how everyone liked dunking their donuts in their coffee, bringing about the perfect name for the shop, Dunkin' Donuts. However, William didn't start this alone. He had a partner, 
one Harry Winokur, who was in fact his brother-in-law. And you know how they always say, don't mix business with family. Well, their story is an excellent example as to why that's good advice. As Duncan grew in popularity, William wanted to use the newfound love the general population had for their coffee to expand. He wanted as many people as possible to enjoy their delicious coffee and donuts just before they went for work or school or any time they had a craving really. In order to do that, they needed to franchise, but Harry didn't exactly share the same views. He was bitter that most of the credit for their success went to William. So in a fit of anger and jealousy, he decided that he didn't want to have a stake in Dunkin' Donuts anymore. Unhindered, William went ahead with his plans. In 1955, the first franchise store in Dedham, and by the year 1963, they opened their 100th store. Business was thriving, but William was tired. He handed over the reins to his 25-year-old son, Robert, who, as a Harvard graduate, was ready to take the reins. The young Rosenberg smoothed over a lot of their problems. Their menu was all over the place. Some branches served a range of sandwiches and burgers, while others offered a wide menu of breakfast options, which, as you can imagine, didn't go good for their reputation. They moved to paper and styrofoam cups and presented biscuits, bagels, donut holes, munchkins, croissants, breakfast sandwiches, culottas, and different drinks. In addition to introducing a national advertising program, Bob began to offer franchises to multi-unit administrators, introduce satellite areas, and later a grocery store framework, every one of which helped fuel development by removing the need for buildings big enough to house donut manufacturing and production. When they move into Texas, the result is disastrous. Six of the 10 new stores close the franchisee, blames the corporate office for not advertising or paying enough attention to their store. The company is bleeding money as more franchisees sue them for violation of contract for allegedly focusing more on getting new contracts than helping the existing ones. When Bob hears of the suit, he's so upset he vomits. Now he has to tell his father about his company's current state. The board of directors almost fired him until he introduced fried donut holes, which soon became Duncan's shining stars, Munchkins. Not only did the franchisee sales grow, but so did their trust in the company, saving them from their looming doom. When their growth in popularity hindered, they needed to find a way to get their customers to really trust them. What better way to do that than with advertisement? After holding hundreds of auditions, Dunkin' Donuts settled on Michael Vale. Their first TV ad, Fred the Baker, an ad that encapsulated the everyday man and his routine of hard work, dramatizing Dunkin's brand, delicious products everyone can afford. The baker soon became Duncan's mascot and a beloved figure. With the brand's newly raised profile, demand increases for their classic pairing, donuts and coffee. The commercials ran on television from 1981 to 1997 and the world grew to love Fred the Baker. His attitude towards work and his customers made people trust the brand to always give them fresh donuts unlike ones bought from the supermarket. Years later, in 2000. Five Vale died. But his association with Dunkin' Donuts' brand image continues to live on. Their first international store opened in Japan in 1971, and by 1979, their 1,000th store opened in the US. William Rosenberg still made international trips to his franchisees, checking on their upkeep. He believed that the more success they got required more attention to detail, for it was this insistence on excellence that made his fortune. By 1983, they had more than 12,000 stores in malls, shopping centers, and restaurants throughout the Northeast. When new stores open, founder Rosenberg is there, beaming as he cuts the ribbon and offers coffee to customers, feeling like the king of coffee. In 1989, Duncan is sold to a British company with Robert Still at the helm, a move that shifted Duncan into a new profitable strategy. They removed the counters and the kitchens from the stores, 
making them significantly smaller. The change benefited the company. A year later, they had opened over 2,000 stores in total. In 1999, Dunkin' Donuts celebrated the sale of their 8 billionth cup of coffee. The next year, they opened their 5,000th store outside the US. Dunkin' Donuts continue to grow as a part of Dunkin's brands, which include Baskin Robbins and Togo Sandwich Stores. Dunkin' Donuts accounts for 80% of sales, making them ripe for a takeover. In 2006, three companies bought Dunkin' for 2.4 billion dollars. Weeks later, they come out with a multi-million dollar ad campaign aiming at their upscale competitor. They call it America Runs on Dunkin'. Coffee now accounts for 63% of Dunkin' Donuts sales. They're the largest chain for brewed coffee, selling approximately 1 billion cups a year. Can you imagine William went from selling coffee out of a food truck during lunch to selling over 1 billion cups a year? If that isn't amazing, I don't know what is. On that note, I'd like to end this video right here with a question for you. What are some of your favorite things to order at Dunkin'? Do let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm so more people can see our videos and so that you can be notified when we launch our next video. We try and put out at least one new one per week and as you can imagine, the research and editing alone of these type of videos takes us close to 18 hours. So we would really appreciate it if you could also check out our Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can support our work. We produce over 12 videos per month, so that is literally 8 cents per video. Thank you so much and we'll see you at our next unmasking.